My name is Mike Morford. Some of you may know me as co-host of the podcast Criminology. I'd like to tell you about a solo podcast that I host, which is very close to my heart. It's called The Murder of My Family. We've all heard about horrible murder cases in the news, both solved and unsolved. Most of the time, we listen for a moment and then go about our daily routine. But have you ever wondered who those murder victims were or thought about their backgrounds? They're more than a blurb in the news or a statistic. They were real people living real lives. They were someone's child, parent, sibling, or friend. In The Murder of My Family, I try to get to know those victims with the help of the people that knew them best, their family members. Together, we talk about the lives and tragic deaths of their loved ones, as well as the ripple effect the murderers had on surviving friends and family. Some of the episodes feature high-profile cases you're probably familiar with, like the Colonial Parkway murders, the Delphi murders, or the Golden State Killer murders. But many other cases are ones from small towns all over America that barely made the news. There are dozens of episodes of The Murder of My Family available right now to binge on. Subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. Hi, I'm Laura. And I'm Jill. And this is Crime Divers. Welcome to today's episode. Hello. And today we have a lot of sword. We do have a lot of sword today. So where in the world are we? Well, actually, I think we're somewhere we might not have been before. Oh. I and mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but we are in South Africa. No, not been in South Africa before. So I thought, well, you know, let's travel the world a little bit, broaden our horizons, <laughs> and, and try somewhere new. Okay, well, that sounds good to me. So what's your case called? It is called The Scissor Murderess. Oh. Does that okay. give you any clues? Well, I'm thinking... <laughs> well, yeah, obviously, I'm thinking two things. <laughs> she was either a hairdresser... No. Nope. ...or she murdered with scissors, or both. Well, we shall find out. Okay, so... Are you ready to dive in? Yeah. I thought I was going to say something there, sorry. No. Yeah, yeah like, right, I'm ready to dive in, are you? I'm ready to dive in. <laughs> okay. Marlene Limburg was born on the 15th of October 1955 in South Africa. Now, I couldn't find a lot on her childhood, so this story starts in February 1972 when Marlene was 16 years old. Okay. Uh, she began her first job as a clerical assistant receptionist at the Red Cross Children's Hospital in, in Rondebosch. I don't know if that's how you pronounce it. Rondebosch. <laughs> I, I don't know. In I Cape, can't pronounce anything, so... Well, it's in Cape Town, right. South Africa. Okay. She started work in the orthopaedic workshop alongside a man called Christian Vanderland. <laughs> and I'm laughing because every time I say Vanderland, do you know what it makes me think of? That guy from Dawson's Creek. No. Oh. <laughs> Is his name not James Van Der Beek? Oh, that's Van Der Beek. Oh, that's no, really right. No, it makes me think of the our game Red Dead Redemption on the PlayStation. Because oh. that's, remember, remember Vanderland? No. No. Yeah. No. That's his name. Is it? Not the, not the main character. His name's Marston. No, not the main character on Red Dead Redemption 2. The, the guy that's in charge of the camp. I have no idea. I haven't you, played you, it for months. But you've played it enough. Months ago. <laughs> You just played it not that long ago, so that's why you remember. Oh, right, okay. Right, fine. Well, anyway, it reminds me of him. Well, it reminds me of Dawson, for Dawson's Creek. Right, okay. Well, <laughs> let's just move on from that. So, Vanderland was the workshop's chief technician, and Marlene, who is described as a bright, intelligent, and attractive 16 year old, she, you know, she was apparently drawn to him right from the start, so she also had a thing for him. Okay. She, um, yeah, I think she just had a, you know, a liking to him, and had a wee soft spot. So from what I could find out about Marlene's upbringing, because I know I said I didn't have a lot um, that I couldn't find, but I did find out that she had been, um, or, sorry, her upbringing had been very strict. Her father rarely displayed any affection towards her. She hadn't been allowed to socialise and she'd never like been to like, things like the cinema or anything like that during her time at school. Um, so she just didn't really get... That's a shame. Yeah, not not not, you know, not let out to do things and bits and pieces. Just but I think that's part of like, growing up. Like, oh, yeah. you know, it's not all about just learning stuff, like going to school and learning stuff. Like you're still learning stuff by 
going out and socialising with other people. We're watching films with just being out in the world. It's life experience, isn't yeah, it? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. I don't believe that you should... I mean, you, you do need to have some discipline and you're a bit strict and all that, but you need to let them, you know, spread their wings. Live their life. Yeah, exactly. But, you know, apparently her father was quite strict. So. Okay. Um, she was very intelligent. Uh, I've already said that, have I? Yeah, she was a very intelligent young girl. Ac- academically, she was very intelligent and she came first in her class... But she had no experience of boys or men, you know, she was very naive and just, you know, totally innocent and she you know, didn't have experience with men or anything like that because she never got the opportunity of just not being allowed out. And yeah. Um, so she tried to get her attention via her studies. She was drawn to Vanderland. I, I don't really know what I've got in here. Oh my God, seriously, can you not read your own writing again? No, no. So she, yeah, she was drawn to Vanderland. Um, she, he was a person who she saw as being like a warm and friendly father figure. I think. Right. So that's why she. I think she was drawn to him. Did you see how old he was? Um. Was he just older? Yeah. Did I see how old he was? Um. No, I don't think I did. No, I don't know how old he was, but he, but he was older. Right. Yeah. Older. Um. So. Christian, that's his first name, Bundland, and Marlene, they initially struck up a, like a father-daughter type relationship, like I said, you know, you mm-hmm. seen all that. So at first, um, so it was, like, it was like that at first, but as the months passed, they, you know, they grew closer, and in April 1973, a year after they met, they began having an affair. Ah. Uh, oh, so he was not so much a father anymore. No, then. not so much of a father. So they went from being like a father-daughter to a relationship. Throughout the remainder of the year, Marlene and Christian continued to meet in secret, so of course it was... You know, nobody knew about it. Yeah. Uh, in early 1974, though, their intimacy stopped and Christian suspected that they were being watched because his wife had started to receive an anonymous calls. Right. So he obviously got cold feet, I think, yeah. on that and, you know, decided to cool it off a bit, I think. So Christian had told Marlene that he would never leave his wife. Never. Uh, Marlene was convinced that they could have a more permanent relationship if Christian's wife, Susanna, was out of the way. So she was like... I want her out of the way, basically. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So by July 1974, Marlene was becoming very, very desperate. She started talking about leaving Cape Town. And I'm assuming she couldn't cope without Christian uh, refusing to leave his wife. But he persuaded her not to go. So I'm confused because he was like, well, I'm not really my wife, but yeah. He didn't want her to go. Well, he obviously just wanted to have his cake and eat it. Oh, yeah, basically. So, I don't know. So, she didn't go. She didn't leave. So, she must have just got on with things for the next few weeks. But then, by September, she had tired of the situation. And decided, she actually decided to go and confront Susanna. Uh, so, but, uh, why is she confronting the wife? Exactly. Like, I was like, what has she done wrong? Because I'm thinking, you're like a very young, naive girl who has, like, really... I mean, this is... I'm assuming her first relationship yeah. with anybody. Uh-huh. And, you know, he's with his wife. So she's like, well, no, I want you. So now I'm going to confront your wife about that. Um, yeah, like you should be confronting him, not his wife. Exactly. So Marlene called Susanna and explained that she and Christian were very much in love and were seeing each other every other night. Marlene wanted to know what Susanna was going to do about it. <laughs> uh, but Susanna hung up on her. Um and then a, so and then a few weeks later Marlene phoned her again and this time she managed to convince Susanna to a meeting between them the two of them right she had actually uh, uh, convinced her to meet up with her so they met in a town called Belleville in early October so initially Marlene had hoped that she and Susanna could come to some sort of arrangement concerning Christian but this <laughs> what kind of arrangement was she expecting but I don't really you can have them on Monday. <laughs> well, we we wait till you hear a wee bit more because you might think. Oh. Uh, but so yeah, so this meeting was basically a, a chance to sort of you know change all these ideas. Susanna told Marlene that she would never give Christian a divorce because of the children, so they had a couple of kids as right. well. Oh. But she also added that she didn't mind playing second fiddle as long as Marlene didn't mind either. So basically, Susanna was saying, "Okay, you go to have an affair with the husband." <laughs> I don't mind. Like, I'm happy uh, to be the second fiddle here. You go and have an affair, but I ain't divorcing them. Oh, okay. And I'm like, I'm sorry, but if somebody came to me and said, 
oh, I'm having an affair with your husband. I'm not going to go, oh, that's fine. You just have an affair. <laughs> I'm not divorcing them, but I don't mind if you carry on with them. Maybe she was having an affair or maybe she wanted to. So she was like, well, if I let him go and have an affair, that means I can as well. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. But so, so basically, yeah, she was saying that... And maybe they just wanted to stay together for the kids. Well, I think that's partly what it was. Because she was basically saying, I don't mind what you and, her, you and my husband get up to, but I'm not divorcing them. So right, that okay. was that. And it was obvious to Marlene that Susanna was prepared to do anything to keep her husband. So right. she was not prepared to, 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 to let go. go right. to I don't know, maybe. And maybe in those times, because it was, what was I saying, 1960s, maybe she... But she obviously didn't work. Susanna, it was the 1960s. It was the 1970s. Did I say 70s? You said something about 72. Oh, I thought she was born in the 1960s. Yes, yeah, sorry, they met in 1972. I'm getting confused with my dates today. Um, so yeah, but I suppose she was still at home looking after the kids, not working and stuff. Um, so she probably didn't want to... Maybe she enjoyed the lifestyle or something as well. I Maybe. I don't know. But anyway, she basically... She, wasn't she obviously had her reasons. Yeah, she had her reasons. So... It was about around this time that Marley met a man called Marthinus Charles Chobo. <laughs> Marthinus? Marthinus, yeah. Mm. Marthinus Charles Chobo. But I'll refer to him as just Chobo because... Okay, I've never even <laughs> heard of that Marthinus before. Yeah, it's like a South African... Uh, maybe. But anyway. But he had come to the orthopaedic wor- workshop to have an artificial limb fitted. Uh, he was unemployed and his disabilities, both physically and social, had destroyed his self-esteem. So I think this may have made him particularly susceptible to Marlene's approaches because Marlene was going to approach him. All oh, right, okay. So Marlene first contract contracted contacted <laughs> was bad as you contacted. Shogo. Don't blame me. Oh, every time, Shogo. every time you fuck up, you blame me. <laughs> That's because it's your take point. responsibility. Own it. Okay, it's not, <laughs> I made a mistake. I'm sorry. <laughs> So Marlene first contacted Shogo by letter. She asked him to come and see her at the orthopaedic workshop. She said if he was clever, he could still earn some good money because I'm assuming he wasn't really working and stuff. Just right. With being a bit... Well, I told you that, yeah, he wasn't employed. So, of course, he wasn't working. So, he was basically sure that he could earn some money. Right. When he arrived, Marlene gave him some money and asked him to meet her at the Rondebosch Town Hall at 7pm. Marlene gave him a bottle of gin and said that she wanted him to murder a woman for her. <laughs> Shogo declined at first. It was fair, yeah, enough, fair enough. Saying that he was afraid of being sent to the gallows. Okay. Which, you know, yeah. Totally mm-hmm. get that. Totally get that. <laughs> I would be the same. Uh, after some discussion, Shogo finally agreed to Marlene's request. So several days later, he went to the Vanderland's address in Boston, Belleville which Marlene had given him, and he later claimed that he planned to warn Susanna that her life was in danger, but instead he simply asked for money. She said she didn't have any and went back into the house. So he basically turned up at Susanna's house. Asked for money? Asked for money. She said she didn't have any, and she went back inside the house. And he didn't murder her? And he didn't murder her. Right. So okay. That, so that didn't happen. So a week later, Shogo and Marlene met again. This time he admitted that he was scared to go through with the murder, which, yeah. well, you know, he doesn't want to end up in the gallows, so clearly, fair enough. I know, but it's quite funny, well, not funny, but he said he doesn't want to murder her because he doesn't want to end up in the gallows. Not that the fact that he doesn't want to take somebody's life, oh, yeah, that's or true. he doesn't want to, you know, <laughs> take this mother away from their children or whatever, <laughs> know, you know. Actually, he's just thinking of himself. Yeah, he's that. just thinking of himself, isn't he? Yeah, that totally. struck me. The first time you said it, I was like, really? Yeah. Like, I never actually thought of it like that, but no, you're right enough, right enough, guys. He's bored about him getting in trouble, no bother yeah. the fact that he'd be taking somebody's life. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. So Marlene gave him a radio and promised that she would help him to receive an artificial limb if he went through with it. So she was obviously trying to bribe him, I think, there, just trying to give him stuff to Well, do. um, did, did, which limb did he not have? I think it was his arm. Right. But I can't remember if I did actually find that out or not. I feel like it was his arm, but I'm not I was just sure. wondering how that if it would affect him being able to kill somebody yeah, like you know. no, I think I think it was his arm but I'm not I'm not 100% sure okay I might I might, I might have written it down I might have done a U and I've totally forgotten <laughs> but at the moment I've just written an artificial limb so I don't know Um. so Shogo went to the Vandalins again but on this occasion he simply walked past the house and made no attempt to enter okay so he clearly bottled it again again yeah which is good well and yeah at, at that, that point it's good it's good <laughs> So shortly afterwards, Marlene sent Shogo a second letter and again urging him to go through with the murder 
um, using a knife if he had to. I don't know what she'd ask him to use in the first place if he hadn't been using a knife. I'm not sure what she'd said or maybe she hadn't said, I don't know. She then got another message to him asking him again to call her at work. So during that call, Marlene insisted that he went through with the murder. She actually promised him a car and she promised to have sex with him after the crime had been committed. So she was just like totally trying to bribe him here with anything and everything to make him do it. <laughs> just, I was just trying to think, like, do people, would somebody actually think that was worth it? Like, I'll give you sex so that you kill somebody. Like, I yeah. think, I'm not that desperate, I'll buy you a mate. car if you kill somebody. I mean, but then maybe to him, because well, he's unemployed. Well, the car, and... but like the sex, I'd be like, you think a lot of yourself. <laughs> <laughs> that's true, I never thought about like what that. What makes you think that I want to have sex with you? Yeah, that's true. Well, maybe, maybe he did, I don't know. <laughs> Who knows? So in October 1974, Marlene handed in her notice at the hospital and she told Christian that she was going to leave Cape Town. I'm assuming this time he didn't try to stop her because there's no mention of her trying to convince her this time. Right. So on the 24th of October, Marlene picked up Shogo from his house and drove him to the Van Glen's address. He was armed this time with a hammer, which he was going to use to kill Susanna. So did he have a different weapon each time? Well, I don't know what he had the first time, but... no. Was then it well, she knife. Well, she'd say to him to use a knife. Mm-hmm. I don't know if he actually did have a knife, but he had a hammer to this time. So Marlene dropped him off in the vicinity, and then she sped away. So just dropped him off, not quite at the house, but nearby. Right. And then sped away. So I'm not sure how, because it basically it said that shortly after Shogo was spotted by Susanna. So I don't know if he was like, she maybe been looking out her window and she saw him walking mm-hmm. past or whatever. But, of course, she was quite alarmed because she had seen him, you know, in the area on several occasions. He'd been at the door. Yeah. So she was like, oh, my God, like, there's this guy again. It's yeah. strange. What What's he doing? So she actually phoned the local police station and Shogo was picked up by the police. So they obviously came out, found him wandering around. So, again, he's not murdered. No, <laughs> picked up by the police. And that, that was about two blocks from uh, from her house. So he must have just been wandering around at this point. I don't know if he was trying to psych himself up for Yeah, anything. probably. Because obviously he's bo- he keeps bottling it. Yeah. So he's obviously like trying to get up the courage. Exactly. So at the police station, he was actually beaten and warned not to return to the area. Oh. So I don't know if that's like a South African thing. They must but that, the police That's there. an old time thing. That, like that's happened. Yeah. Well, you see in the films in the old days. Yeah, you get getting beaten up. up and yeah. 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 So yeah, so he got a bit roughed up and told not to return to the area. So, after repeated failures from Shogo, Marlene decided to take matters into her own hands again. She, uh, well, I'm a, well in, a, in a way, I'm kind of glad for him because I kind of felt a bit sorry for him. Yeah. Because I was thinking, he, he obviously wanted what she was offering uh-huh. him because like, he, he wasn't working and stuff. So, yeah. you know. I think he was just quite a vulnerable man, to be honest. Yeah, that's what it sounds like. like. Yeah, that's what I, it sounds like he should, she was kind of preying on a vulnerable guy. Mm-hmm. And if he really was... A murderer, he would have went and done it straight away. You know yeah. what I mean? If he had it in him, yeah. he probably would have done it by now. So the fact that he kept bottling it, I was kind of feeling sorry for because him. Because his part of the story is not done yet, though. Oh, okay. So there is more for more to come from. Oh, am I not going to feel sorry for him later? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, well maybe, maybe. Okay, well, at the moment, because he hasn't done anything. Yeah. He's not done anything. I just feel moment. like she's kind of taken advantage of him. Yeah, but I think basically she did. Yeah, yeah she just wanted something to do her dirty work, basically. Yeah. But and he obviously it, didn't want to do it. No, not really, because like I say, he would have done it if, if he had really wanted to do it, he would have done it. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, so she's obviously taking matters into her own hands again. So she approached a man called Rob Newman. He was a 24-year-old engineering student who she knew. She asked to borrow his pistol, because he had a gun. Right. So I think, I don't know, South Africa, like a lot of people have guns there, is that the same as America? I don't know. I think you do. I think it's the same sort of thing where you probably have your own gun. He, of course, refused... So, of course, then she was like, well, if you want to give me a gun, will you kill somebody for me then? <laughs> uh, so, again, he refused that as well, because mm-hmm. he was quite sensible. But on the 28th of October, Newman's uh, gun was stolen from his room. So he reported the theft to the police and he suggested that Marlene was the likely um, suspect. Yeah. Because Cause she'd been she'd asking, been asking yeah. for it, yeah. So, <laughs> so... Around 8.30 on Monday the 4th of November 1974, Marlene arrived at Shogo's house. So she said that the car was packed and she was on her way to Johannesburg. But before she left, she needed she needed Shogo to come with her to the Vandalin's house. 
He claimed in a statement that it wasn't until she handed him the gun on the way that he realised she wasn't just going to say goodbye. So I'm not really sure what he told she what? told him. Right, yeah. So she must have been like, oh, I need you. But then I, told, I was confused. So she was rocked up in her car mm-hmm. to say that she was going, but yet she needed him to basically chum her to the Bangladesh so that she could say goodbye. And I'm thinking, well, why would he need to go with you? She, she must have had some reason that it's just not been Yeah, I, I, um, I agree. I mean, I, I don't, you know, I don't think he was like the brightest of persons as well. You know, he yeah. was quite a simple person. and that. So maybe he was just believed what she said or was quite easily, well, I don't know. But I just well, don't understand why, if she was just going to say goodbye, why he would need to go with her. She, she maybe said something else. We just don't know what it was. Yeah, so basically she handed him the gun and was like, <laughs> so and he's like oh for fuck's sake not I, again yeah, here we go again so they arrived outside the house just after 9am Susanna was home alone from this from this point Marlene and Shogo's accounts of what happened actually differ right so Marlene this is Marlene's account she claimed that she got out of the car she rang the doorbell and returned to the car while Shogo entered the house alone and committed the murder right so not um entirely sure why one Susanna would have let him in the house because if she'd already reported she'd him to the police, him to the police yeah. earlier because she was a bit alarmed of seeing him in the area and then all of a sudden again he's turned up at the door I'm not yeah, sure yeah surely it. surely the, and the police probably would have said to her look if he, if he ever turns up again just just phone the police oh, yeah. and... so I'm, I'm not sure that he would have just walked into the house and, and committed unless he well, did they bar- did it maybe force well, himself in? Well, say that he forced himself in. I mean, maybe right. he did. It yeah. doesn't say that he did, but maybe he did. Maybe the door was unlocked and, it unlocked and he just walked in. Maybe, I don't know. But Shogo, he maintained that they acted together. Okay. So throughout Shogo's account, um, it was actually... Um, sorry, Shogo's account, it was supported by a neighbour of the Vanderlands. That morning, uh, Mrs. Marias had walked past Marlene's car twice in the space of 10 to 12 minutes, and both times the car was empty. So bear in mind, Marlene said that she'd rang the doorbell and she went back to the car. So, but, but this she, woman said that she'd walked past her car twice right, the and car it was, was empty. empty. Shogo said that after Marlene rang the bell, they went into the house together. When Susanna saw them both, she became frightened and threatened, and threatened to phone the police. She tried to get away, but was tripped by Marlene. She fell and hit her head on the door. While Susanna was on the floor, Marlene struck her on the jaw with a pistol. And then, with Marlene's instruction, Shogo began to throttle Susanna, who was semi-conscious. Marlene then gave him a pair of scissors okay. she had taken from the sideboard, and Shogo said he remembered stabbing Susanna three times, but the later, the pathologist later noted that there was actually seven stab wounds, six had penetrated her chest, so there was more stab wounds than he recalled right. doing. So he did stab her right. with a pair of scissors okay. that Marlene had given him. After the murder, Marlene squirted green dye over Shogo using a gas pistol Susanna had asked her husband to buy after she'd seen Shogo in the neighbourhood. So she don't say, I don't know if this was a thing. But I'm like, what? It's a, it was like green dye over um, I, don't, I don't really know why. But it was like something that, that Susanna had asked her husband to buy after she'd seen Shogo in the area. So I don't know if it's like I'm looking at you confused. confused. No, as a as a gun, as a get up. No, no, I'm confused myself there. <laughs> this is why sometimes I hate when I write stuff down. So after the murder, Marlene squirted green dye over Shogo, using a gas pistol. So the 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 the, the gun. Suzanne had asked her husband to buy her the gun, after she had seen uh-huh. Shogo in the neighbourhood. I'm not sure what the whole green dye was about actually though. But I don't know. I don't know. I don't know where that comes from. I don't. I don't know. I don't really. <laughs> For goodness. Sake. Forget that. We'll just carry on. So Marlene told Shogo that she would deny any involvement in the murder if he went to the police. She then took him home before setting off for Johannesburg. So Susanna's body was discovered by her daughter about one p.m. that day. Christian had tried to phone Susanna a few times that morning. You know, just to you know, see how she was, check up on her. He must have done that quite regularly, I think. Yeah. Um, but when he didn't get a reply, he became quite concerned. So he was spoke to his daughter, Zelda, who worked at the local hospital. Um, he'd asked her to go home during her lunch break to see if anything was like wrong or anything like that. Um, when she arrived, the 
the the door was locked but she caught a glimpse of her, of her mum lying on the living room floor so she must have looked through the window and she'd obviously seen her lying on the living room, the living room floor mm. so when this is I found, I found this quite horrible actually I don't know why, why you would do this but so when, when the police brought Christian home to identify his wife which again I thought was quite strange because I thought if the, if she if, if his daughter had phoned the police and you know the body I don't know if they take the body away or whatever and you know when you identify somebody mm-hmm. it's normally like at a morgue or whatever but he must have brought, brought him home while, while his wife was still lying in the house so so he brought her he brought her home to identify his wife and he casually turned the body with his foot so he just like she yeah. obviously must be lying so he's just went in and went like that with his foot um, and said that it was his wife so he's like rolled her over with his foot and I'm like but why would you do that? Like, to me, that just sounds a bit. I don't know. It just sounds a bit disrespectful. And well, yeah. casual and just yeah, like just like you know, that's like you lying on the floor, and me coming in and going and tapping you with my foot and rolling you over and going, oh yeah, that's her. Yeah, that's what I mean. It just seems a bit. <laughs> I just thought that was quite cold and just... yeah, and you would think that they would take her as you said, right? They would take her to the bar first before being identified, oh, so yeah. that because usually. I've never identified identified a body, but do they not like sort of maybe clean them up a bit as well if there's like blood and well, yeah, and just, just kind of cover up so they maybe just look like they're sleeping uh, or whatever. Yeah. Well, that's what I just thought. Normally, you wouldn't let anybody into the crime scene if you know. Well, cause, yeah, because you're con- Aye. you could know because they can contaminate the. Well, crime yeah, because that's what I thought. I mean, if he's obviously you know been at work when his daughter's found found her, so she she, she would have called the police and they would have came. And then I, I get that he maybe needs to formally identify her, but you would have thought that maybe it would have been a case of, well, you have to go to the hospital or mm-hmm. you know, you're not allowed into the house because it is a crime scene. Yeah. So you casually I come in and just that. roll your foot over and turn her over and go, oh, yeah, that's my And there you go, like by him just touching her with his foot, mm-hmm. he could have passed something yeah. over, you know, so, like, I don't know, something from his foot onto her. So, yeah, that's weird. Yeah, so I just thought that was quite. Well, I've just never heard of anybody do that. I just mm. <laughs> that was quite like, oh right, okay. Yeah, so it was reported reported at the time by the police by the police um officers who were present as appearing like callous and almost if as if he was expecting it. Like it was just like, Oh yeah, all right. Okay, mm. yeah, so I'm not bothered. And it was also suggested at the time that Christian maybe had an influenced Marlene in order to get her and murder his wife, but that was never proven, so right. he was never But he said that he was never gonna leave her, so why would he encourage her? Well, maybe he was never going to leave her, but he was quite happy to... Well, to yeah, maybe him. he didn't want to, like, get a divorce because he didn't want her getting the, his money or something like yeah. that, maybe. But, but, no, but, I mean, nothing like that was ever proven. I mean, right. there was never any... and His involvement was never questioned or anything like right. that. So it was just a, a suggestion, I think, at the time, but nothing, nothing was ever yeah. followed up by that. And so the the police immediately, of course, you know, began a murder investigation... And their, their chief suspect was actually Shogo, as he had been spotted in the area on several occasions, but they didn't know it was him, if you know what I mean. Like, they knew, they didn't know who he was. Right. So, yes, he was the chief suspect, but they didn't know that was him. So, they just, like, had a description of this guy. Yeah, and... because, because they'd had, yeah. um, you know, like, they'd been spotted in the area a few times, so they, 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 the description of them, that they knew it was him, they just didn't, they hadn't identified it as being Shogo at that right, point. yeah. So... And, and of course, at first, nobody, you know, considered that Marlene was involved in this at all. You know, right. she wasn't a suspect at first. And we never thought she would have hired anybody to kill, to kill her like that, so she wasn't. So for the next week, police efforts to establish Shoga, Shoga's identi- identity and whereabouts were unsuccessful. But around 7.30am on 13th of November, they did get a breakthrough when a police officer actually arrived to see Marlene. So he just did a, arrive just to, you know, just to come and ask her some questions because she was an acquaintance of Christian, so, mm. you know, just, just, you know, follow up leads and stuff like that, just questioning people that he knew, yeah. people that he worked with, that, you know, it's a normal inquiry. Um, so they'd asked her to come down to the station to ask her a few questions, but Marlene admitted on the way that her and Christian were lovers. So, of course, that was like... Mm. So it's like, right, okay, you're a suspect. <laughs> yeah, you're definitely more involved now. So she added that she had been expecting the police to contact her ever since she had heard about the murder of Susanna from her mum. So... She, I'd be like, well, that's like alarm bells ringing there already. So when she was asked if she had an association with a man called Martha Shogo, she denied denied that. 
She was asked if she had asked for the gun from Robert Newman. She said she had, but it was just meant as a laugh. So she just asked for it for a laugh. Okay. She was also noted as being like unnaturally nervous at times during the interview. Mm-hmm. She, you know, she just wasn't, she was getting all nervy about like the questions and stuff, which I suppose if you've done something bad, you probably do get quite nervous. I would get nervous whether I've done something or not. Oh, no, I wouldn't like that. I get nervous coming through the customs at um, oh, the airport. No, I'm like that, so I'm like, I'm like, what have I done something? Like, have, I done, have I done something bad? Have I got something on me? <laughs> uh, so yeah, so she obviously must have been totally, you know, I'd say she was nervous. So at some point um, during the interview, she just suddenly blurted out that she had took Shogo to the Vanderland house. Um, waited for him outside and then took him home afterwards. So it was like she just volunteered that information, I think, really. She didn't... So she still did it, but she had nothing to do with it. She just took him yeah. there and... Yeah, but of course she was then arrested and formally charged with the murder of Susanna Vanderland. Later that day, she did then make a full statement in which she admitted that she had asked Shogo if he would kill Susanna. And in her statement, she said that she had waited in her car while she committed the crime. So Shogo was, you know, finally arrested that same day because they finally had his proper identity, so they, they um, arrested him. So both were found guilty at trial and both were sentenced to death. Mm. But two months later, the case was reopened on an appeal and Marlene was then sentenced to 20 years and Shogo 15 years. So they didn't... So the, the, the death penalty. Yeah, the death penalty, yeah, the death penalty but they were still, obviously, had to serve time in, in prison. Uh, Shogo, he was released after 11 years in June 1986 and Marlene was also released on parole in December that same year. Uh, Marlene, she committed suicide in October 2015 when she was 60. She had suffered from osteoporosis for years and had also been diagnosed with breast cancer. Basically, she couldn't live with the pain anymore. And Shogo, he died in a car accident in 1992. And after the trial, the law known as the Marlene Lindbergh Clause was passed in South Africa, preventing convicted criminals from profiting from their crimes, as it was believed that Marlene planned to sell her story to the press for a large sum of money. Mm. So, yeah, that's that was it. So she was a, a bitch, basically, because she wanted their... <laughs> She she wanted to be with this man and and rather than he would they wouldn't get divorced so she didn't feel like there's any other option but she had to get her killed but she never got with him anyway because she ended up in jail <clears throat> well exactly again so it's just stupid I know like time after time like <laughs> you know if you're not going to go through proper channels of people getting divorced then you can't be with each other it's, it's, uh, it, it's, murder's never the answer how many times have we got to say this it is not the answer um. And yeah, but no, there was no no happy ending for anybody there. Okay, well, thank you for that. And thank you to everybody for listening. And if you would like to follow us on any of our social media channels, um, I'll put that in the show notes. And if you obviously like us and want to keep listening to us, don't forget to subscribe, rate, rate review. review. Thanks for listening. Bye. Bye.